Hey camp followers, it is an exciting evening. I'm really, really, well, I'm so proud to be able to get Daryl Millis here to come and talk to all you guys. So this guy is pretty impressive. Um, he's extremely busy. Um, he's very hard to pin down. Um, Travelling all over the world. Um, please tell them a little bit about yourself because I can't do you justice, really. Sure. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Daryl Millis. I uh, teach orthopedic surgery and also run the physical rehabilitation and sports medicine department at the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine, where we do uh, quite a bit of work regarding arthritis as well as rehab, uh, motion and exercise, uh, trying to put some of the science to that, as well as run the certified canine rehabilitation practitioner program which is uh, taught worldwide to help teach uh, professionals about managing cases with physical rehabilitation, um, of which uh, an important part of that is managing the arthritic patient. So thrilled to be here to, to chat about that a bit and uh, hopefully answer some of your questions as well. So Cam Fuller's. This is really quite a one in a, a lifetime for Cam. So this is really, really big. So if you've got questions, then get them down today because Daryl knows so much. I have attended the CCRP. I will do my exam soon, I promise. Um, <laughs> I've done your OA practitioner online course and it is fantastic. It's extremely thorough. So any vets or vet nurses or vet techs that are, are watching this is a really, really worthwhile course to do. And we can give you details of how to get access to it. Um, we're going to jump straight in there. We're going to talk about a blog that you recently released. It was only a few days ago, actually, and it's already gone a little bit viral. So it's a good topic to start on. And many, many um, of our CAM followers have either got an arthritic dog or have lost an arthritic dog and have a youngster in their house or are they thinking of getting a young pup? And this is going to be very pertinent to them. And we do get asked a lot of questions of how can I avoid arthritis? So let's talk about your blog. What what was it about, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, it was, it was pretty uh, interesting and, and very unexpected, the uh... Uh, the number of shares and likes, we've got over 33,000 reads right now, and it's only about 48 hours old. Yeah. Um, so in the veterinary world, at least, that's, that's quite a bit of interest. And what the topic was about is uh, exercising dogs before the growth plates are closed, because I had heard that from um, a variety of uh, owners that have been told by the breeders, don't do any exercise with the dog until the growth plates are closed. Don't do this or that. And what really kind of brought things to a head was um, a very good friend of mine and colleague who teaches with us um, was told that recently um, he had an owner that had uh, purchased a puppy and the breeder told them not to even take the dog outside until it was a year of age. And so it wow. really got me, yeah. <laughs> I, I wow. mean, taught to potty inside and everything. So you know, really, I mean, the pendulum has gone so far that uh, I thought it would be a good topic for a blog. So I, I did some research and um, we, we have a, a textbook of uh, physical rehabilitation. And in that book is a chapter on the responses of musculoskeletal tissues to disuse and remobilization. So I had reviewed the literature on exercise in young dogs and was very impressed at the level of exercise that young dogs, we're talking you know, between nine and 12 months of age. We're not talking about wee puppies that are just weaned, but these are you know, nearing skeletal maturity and how much exercise these dogs could tolerate with no damage to the cartilage and certainly to the growth plates. And I would have to say in my career of over 30 years now doing orthopedics, I, can, I can't think of a single case where exercise has caused a problem with premature closure of the growth plates. Now, we're not talking about dramatic things like automobile accidents or sometimes another dog slams into uh, a puppy and, and creates trauma. We're not talking about that type of trauma. I mean, that's gonna happen. Kids fall off of swings, they, they fall on the playground, they break an arm or something. Those things happen to youngsters, both dogs as well as people. But actual damage to the growth plates as a re result of too much exercise. And, and so looking at the literature on development of hip dysplasia and so forth, 
There are a couple of things that have been suggested. They do these uh, what are called epidemiological studies, and they don't necessarily show cause and effect, but what are some factors that might be associated with the development of hip dysplasia, for example. And one of the things was not climbing stairs before the dog is three months of age. Okay. You know, they, they found that that was a risk factor. Is it cause and effect? We don't know. And I think that's part of the evidence-based nature of medicine that we need to consider. Um, just like some of the factors that have come into play for heart disease over the years. You know, we hear, oh, don't eat this, don't eat, eat that. It, it could cause heart disease. Well, there's an association, but it may not be a true cause and effect. And then years later, they do... Uh, what's called a prospective study where they randomize two groups and one gets one treatment, the other gets the other. And over a lifetime, what happens? And some of those factors turn out not to be risk factors. Um, I'll use vitamin A as an example for being an antioxidant protective against uh, cancer. Initially, they thought uh, vitamin A in people was protective, but after they studied it, they found out that truly that seem to maybe cause, have a greater risk of causing lung cancer in people. So they Whoa. no longer recommend vitamin A for that type of thing. That's just yeah. an example of how, how studies in, in the evolution of science work. So back to our story with hip dysplasia. Um, so climbing upstairs at a very young age uh, may be a risk factor. Um, doing a lot of uh, rough playing with hard turning and so forth, like maybe agility uh, type training would not yeah. be recommended in a young puppy. But on the other hand, the studies that I, I mentioned, um, they started off with exercising dogs on a treadmill for 10 kilometers a day, five days a week for 16 weeks and found absolutely no damage to the joints. So then they upped it to 20 kilometers um, a day, five days a week for 16 weeks, still no problems. They went for a year 20 uh, kilometers a day. Yeah, uh, five days a week and, and found no damage to the cartilage. When you get up to 40 kilometers a day, uh, five days a week per year, that's when you start to see maybe some uh, changes to the cartilage that you can only pick up with biomechanical testing or biochemical testing. In other words, the cartilage looks absolutely normal, but it's a little bit softer and has some changes where maybe we're starting to get some chinks in the armor but that's a lot of exercise. That's, that's a lot of exercise. Yeah, that's running like a marathon every single day for a year. Um, mm. Huge amount. So we're not talking, I'm not making any recommendations to exercise that amount. I don't think anybody has that kind of time to do that. But it just shows the, the ability of dogs to adapt. And, you know, you, you think about uh, African wild dogs and coyotes and wolves all in the canine family. And, you know, these dogs are out running and playing and developing. But they're developing other board. skills as well, isn't it? It's not just all about the cartilage. It's about knowing where their legs are in space and time and coordination and balance. And yeah. that's yeah. really important to accrue those skills too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I work with some trainers of performance animals, search and rescue dogs, assistance dogs for owners with mobility problems, you know, seeing eye dogs, that type of thing. Yeah. And they're having those dogs do a lot of that type of activity, balance, coordination, strength, because really you, you have to develop those at, at an early age, whether it's a person or whether it's a dog. Yeah. Um, you know, in people, we re reach our peak bone density in our early 20s and peak muscle mass in early 20s, and then it starts to go down from there. Right. So there's been some work in especially adolescent uh, girls that if they do some impact loading, some jumping and so forth, could they increase their bone density a bit more so that over time, as they start to lose that bone density, they're less at risk of having a hip fracture when they're in their 60s and 70s, for example. And a lot of yeah. that research is still going on. So I think the point is making sure we have maximum strength and muscle mass, bone density at an early age. Now, yeah. dogs don't get osteoporosis like people do, but they start to lose some bone mass as they become less active. So keeping it in a kind of like a reality setting, the Kennel Club over here, um, they release guidelines about exercising dogs and they suggest, I think it's five minutes per month of life, increase the exercise. And it starts off on quite a small quantity. So like 
minutes three times a day and then you know as they get a month older 15 minutes etc and I we approached them about six months a year ago and just said where where does that data come from where and they they said it's just guidance because you've got a very broad spectrum of owners you've got a broad spectrum of breeds there is still so much that we don't know we're just trying to just give some practical advice a bit like five fruit and veg a day for humans I don't think that's got any grounding whatsoever but that was launched to try and encourage people to have a much healthier diet and you know something to work towards so you to kind of sum up your blog at present there isn't any evidence to suggest you're likely to really over exercise and damage growth plates in puppies but it's the type of exercise that's really important something that I love is that you've mentioned talk and high impact activities because I hate ball throwers. I hate them. And would you be saying that choosing activity like that in a young puppy would be detrimental, not something you'd want to be doing? Yeah, I think anything, um, and, and it gets back to maybe some ideas about a condition that dogs do get called osteochondritis dissecans which has got a genetic component, uh, component as well as a nutritional component and possibly an impact loading component. And, right. and what this is, it's a condition where um, the cartilage doesn't turn into bone uh, near the joints. And so you end up with a thickened layer of cartilage and that's susceptible to getting a crack in there between the abnormally thick and the normal uh, thickness uh, portion of the joint and a flap can break off and it's OCD or osteochondritis dissecans. The interesting right. thing is that occurs in a very predictable area of the joints. And let's take the shoulder joint, which is uh, probably the most common joints for large and giant breeds to get OCD. But it always seems to be on an area kind of on the back part of the humeral head, the, the uh, ball part of the shoulder joint and just behind where the shoulder blade articulates with it. And so you can imagine if a dog is impact loading, say it jumps down a flight of steps, you know, four or five steps yeah. to the bottom, and it impact loads there, it could cause some damage to the blood vessels, which then um, uh, cause the, uh, the defect or, or the um, inefficient conversion of cartilage to bone. And, yeah. and cartilage doesn't really need a blood supply to survive. I mean, if you look at uh, the, the cartilage of a joint, it doesn't have a blood supply. It gets all of its nutrition from the joint fluid. So it can tolerate low oxygen uh, environments much better than, than bone does. So maybe there's damage to the vasculature that's feeding that portion of the bone. Yeah. There gets to be a big blood clot there. The bone dies, the cartilage gets retained, and then along comes another impact loading and, and the crack occurs again. So right. it's, it's kind of a long-winded explanation to say that it's probably best to avoid high impact loading on uh, uh, joints of young dogs. And that's one yeah. potentially uh, very verifiable reason. Um, yeah. I think that the, the uh, now I know where the guidelines for the five minutes uh, per month come from, because that's been a big thing oh, based yeah. on the blog, Facebook sites and saying, oh, this is the, the recommendation. And so now I, I'm aware of where that comes from. Yeah. Uh, cause, yeah. Because quite frankly, we don't necessarily have that strict of a, a recommendation in the U.S. that I'm aware of. But um, like I say, I deal with a lot of uh, people that are performance dog trainers for search and rescue and, and, and military dogs and so forth. And I would say that that's a pretty conservative amount of exercise. And, yeah. and what does that even mean? Five minutes per day, per month of age. I mean, is that yeah. leash walking? Is that free play? You know, exactly what does that mean? I mean, I would probably interpret it as um, exercise outside of free exercise. So leash walks yeah. and that sort of thing. You're right. It's, it's still very kind of like broad. I've got a good question here. So lovely Rob Ray. Daryl, would your advice regarding exercise change for those individual pups that may be genetically predisposed to hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia or breeds that are of a higher risk for these conditions? Excellent point. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because the studies that I mentioned, those were dogs with normal joints. Mm -hmm. So what about the dog with um, abnormal joints? And you specifically mentioned hip and elbow dysplasia. And I think those are excellent places to start. 
Um, for me, where it begins is early diagnosis. And the earlier you can diagnose a, a dysplastic condition like that, because a joint dysplasia means that the joint is abnormally formed. And one of the reasons it's so hard to get rid of these conditions just by simple breeding, it's not like blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes type of thing where you're going to get, you know, a certain color eyes based on breeding two individuals or two people. Um, you think about the complex nature of the hip joint. What makes up the hip joint? Well, you've certainly got bone length. You've got bone diameter. You've got angles of bone, for example, with the, the hip joint. You have the uh, cup part, the acetabulum, you have the ball part, the femoral head, and there's this angle, there's this angle, there's the angle of, of acetabular version, how that's placed. So that's part of it, the cartilage, the, the muscles, um, their attachments. So all of these things are having to come together with the gen genetic pool. And sometimes we have enough of those things that it makes the abnormal joint. Hopefully most of the time we make a good joint Mm -hmm. But you, you can't just breed the best of the best and always get the best. I mean, we know that. Um, so back to how we can do the best job. I think the best job is to try and eradicate those individuals from a breeding population that certainly have severe forms. Now, the real issue is early identification. There, are, In the U.S., at least, there are two main ways. Um, there's the OFA, the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, and they will only get a grade uh, or give a grade at two years of age. Now, you can certainly diagnose it earlier on a radiograph, but they'll only give you a grade at two years of age because 95% of the dogs that have hip dysplasia will have had it, um, will show it on a radiograph by two years, usually arthritic mm -hmm. changes. But there's a better way to do that, uh, the distraction index, which is also called the pen hip technique. And that was developed to provide uh, some forced distraction on a radiograph to be able to measure the amount of laxity. And over the years, they've developed a pool uh, by measuring the distraction index. And for the common breeds, they can tell you exactly what the chances are that that dog will get hip dysplasia or hip arthritis. Now, it doesn't tell you how severe it will be in terms of clinical signs. Is a dog <laughs> going to barely be able to get up or is it going to pretty have pretty good function but it does tell you the percent chance that that dog will have arthritis in the future but the interesting thing is you can get that done as early as 16 weeks of age uh, even a little right. bit earlier and get ac get accurate results so you can certainly tell at a very early age which of those dogs are going to have laxity in the hips now what what can we do about it if you get it between four and five months of age, if it's a larger giant breed of dog, you can do a very simple procedure called a JPS or juvenile pubic symphysiadesis, which um, is going to cause closure of the pubic symphysis. So the, the pelvis is going to continue to grow and expand. But if we can shut down this growth plate right here in the pubic symphysis, then the rest of the pelvis continues to grow and develop and provide greater coverage of the femoral head. Now, it's not going to correct really severe uh, dysplastic. Hip yeah, hip I heard that was just for like mild and moderate. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, but uh, we, we, did a, we did a little bit of a survey on Holly's Army asking how many owners would feel comfortable um, operating at a such a young age. Because you have to do it before they're like 14 weeks, don't you, or something. It's quite... And um, everybody went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a hell of an ask. Um, something else, just because our population in the UK, we don't do the pen hip because of our imaging regulations and not being able to be in the room or near the animal when taking x-rays. So we do the, the kennel club, the, um, the Norberg angle, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just going back to Robert Raywood's question. So say he say you've got a four month old puppy and say we weren't able to do the pen hip, but the vet had a suspicion because of the breed, maybe because there was a little bit of a gait abnormality. Maybe he did a little bit of a Ortolani type test, maybe felt a little bit laxity. Maybe there wasn't a good muscle mass. So thinking of our people that don't have huge amounts of money to spend on these, you know, investigations, what would your advice be then? So you've got 
potentially the right breed, a few suspicions. You might have done a really um, elbow extension, a little bit of an internal rotation. There's been a little eek, and you think, oh, is there something going on there? What advice would you give regarding that? Yeah, so to re so given the fact that you have a condition there, an abnormal condition, and, and what you said was absolutely right, the Ortolani sign is a good way to check mm -hmm. for laxity of hips. Extending the hip joint, that's another way to, to test for you know hip pain, which is often associated with hip dysplasia. And then the elbow palpating over the coronoid process and pain with hyperextension, those are all good clinical indicators of, of a dysplastic or abnormal joint. So what do we do about it from there? Well, um, I think first and foremost, the most important thing you can do is not let the puppy get overweight because very clearly, excessive weight and obesity are associated with the progression of the arthritis as well as the uh, severity of the condition. So that's the probably the biggest thing you can do from an environmental standpoint. Yeah. I think from a exercise standpoint, um, we know that if you exercise an unstable joint, you'll accelerate the progression of arthritis. And the most, yeah. um, or the best example I can think of with that is um, a rupture of the cranial cruciate ligament. If you have, and it's not a, a puppyhood condition or anything, but it's just a condition that causes an abnormal joint. If you uh, have a rupture of the cruciate ligament and you force exercise on that, you for certain will increase the amount of arthritis that you'll get. Now, you'll probably get to that same point eventually, whether you get there slowly or faster. But I think the, the key thing is to keep the muscle mass strong so yeah. maybe less impact activities such as swimming, walking in an underwater treadmill if one is available. I know, I know hydrotherapy is a big thing in the UK, but anything we can do to keep the muscles stronger mm. with uh, minimizing pressure on the joints, I think is important. Yeah. More spe specifically for the hips, um, I think cautious sit to stand exercises can be good, but mm. we wanna make sure that the hips are or the legs are, are spaced kind of in a normal standing position or a base wide stance to help yes. drive the femoral head further into the acetabulum. If we l allow a base narrow stance, then it's more apt to make that hip subluxate, which is going to cause cartilage wear. Yeah. So how the exercises are done, I think, are quite important. But what we're trying to do is strengthen the gluteal muscles to give better support to the hip yeah. joint and also the uh, the abductors. So yeah. if we can uh, do some strengthening, um, we use elastic bands, we call them TheraBands and on a treadmill, for example, if we wanted to strengthen, I'm trying to show it on the screen here. If we wanted to strengthen the abductor muscles when the dog is walking on a treadmill, we would then pull um, in this direction so that they have to work the muscles harder in this direction to strengthen those abductors. Yeah. Which this actually leads really nicely onto a topic that we both wanted to cover. Um, identification early. So I'm just going to recount a little story that a lot of vets that may be watching this will totally relate to. When you have an owner in for a second vaccine and you pop the dog up onto the table and you're going through all the motions for your preventative health care and you say something's not right. And I've had it a number of times where somebody's come in with maybe a Labradoodle puppy, it's say 12 weeks, and I, I just look at the way it's sitting or the, the, you know, something, I'm like, there's something not right here and we need to keep an eye on it. And you can see they go white and they don't want to know. And they're, they're angry at you because how dare you, this puppy's brand new, it cannot be broken. And that's really difficult as a vet because you're doing it with your, your best intention is to identify early to make sure that that dog has the best opportunity for a good quality of life. And you hit that first hurdle. Then also, as we were talking earlier, having the skill base as a vet to pick up these subtle indicators early, be it posture, behavior or palpational skills, Go back to what we were talking about earlier. You know, palpation and identifying these diseases early isn't easy, is it? No, no. And I think it, it's a skill. 
you know, you have to develop your, um, your examination skills. Um, I do a series of talks. One, I show some videos of lame dogs, and, and these are veterinarians and often veterinary nurses in the audience, and I ask, you know, where is the, is there first of all a lameness? I think that's the first step. Is there a gait abnormality? Yes or no. And then I'll ask, is it front or if it's, or if it's the back? And these are, to me, they're fairly obvious lamenesses, but that's what I do for a living. So I hope I, I'm pretty good at it, but uh, I'd like to even, think so. even I, I, I get fooled, you know, a lot of times, yeah. but even asking if it's a front leg or a back leg lameness, the audience will respond 50, 50. And then if I yeah. tell them if it's a back leg lame and it says it left or right. And again, it's about 50, 50, but after going through the videos and showing things to look for, then they get much better and more comfortable at it. So it is a skill that can be learned. You have to practice it, but your orthopedic exam at an early age is absolutely critical. And, and let's face it, common things occur commonly. So yeah. it, if I get that last vaccination series at about four to six months, on, on the large and giant breeds of dogs, I'm going to check for hip dysplasia. I'm going to check for elbow dysplasia. I'm going to check for shoulder OCD. And the tiny guys, the, the miniature and toy breeds, I'm going to check for luxating patellas. I'm going to check for leg calf perthes disease. Yeah. And playing yeah. the odds, you'll, you'll help a lot of dogs if you identify things early. And it, it, the other thing I ask audiences when I talk specifically about this topic of early identification and orthopedic disease in general, I'll ask them, how, do, how many of you listen to the heart when, you, when a pet comes in for an annual physical? Everybody raises their hand. Of course, we listen to the heart. You know, that's what the doctor is supposed to do is listen to the heart. Okay, how often do you actually find a heart problem? Hmm. Maybe 5% of the time. If I could tell you that 60% of those dogs coming into the practice every day have an orthopedic issue, isn't that worth screening for? I mean, everybody mm -hmm. does the geriatric blood test, the CBCs, the chemistry profiles, the urinalysis. I'm not saying that that's wrong. That's good medicine. But we shouldn't ignore the musculoskeletal system because that's such an important system yeah. in terms of the overall health and quality of life of the pet. And to not identify it, um, we know that, you know, dogs hide their lamenesses very well. So mm -hmm. they only get brought to the veterinarian for a lameness problem when they're limping or barely use the leg. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, just by self-regulation of act activity, it gets a little bit better. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, it goes away and then it gets worse. But it, it's very difficult to see lamenesses. Um, our eyes won't see a forelimb lameness until there's a 20 or 30% difference. We measure this on a force plate. It tells us exactly how much weight the dog is putting on the leg at a walk or a trot. And I can't see a lameness until there's about at least a 20% difference between the two forelimbs. The hind yeah. limbs about an eight to 10% difference. So what that says is there can be a lot of damage in there and we can't see it. So it's up to us as professionals to do our examination every time the animal comes in for yearly vaccine or for the yearly checks, health checks, and also when they're puppies at that last vaccination. And I think that I'm just going to make sure that people hear what you just said, because when you told me, I think it was 2017, I was with you in Palmer and we sat down one lunchtime and I told you what I was trying to do with Cam and you said, um, we've done our own study. These dogs were coming in for dentals and lumps and bits and bobs. And you got permission to do an orthopedic exam and follow up x-rays for your own study. And 60 percent. Now, in the literature, everybody refers to um, Johnson's work, which is 20 percent. So Johnson and all, um, they, they did a big, you know, study where they were looking at the prevalence of arthritis and people always say 20 percent of all dogs and you found three times that amount in your work yeah and let me go back to that study where that comes from was an original marketing study by pfizer back when pfizer uh, had remedel and remedel had first got launched and so it was actually a phone survey of veterinarians 200 veterinarians they would call up and say if you had to guess how many patients coming into your clinic had arthritis, what would you say? And that's where that 20% number comes from. And it's never been wow. really validated. Yeah. And now in cats, they've done radiographic surveys of yeah. geriatric cats and found 
a prevalence of like anywhere from 60 to 90 percent in geriatric yeah. cats that have radiographic arthritis. So we did the same type of thing with dogs and we chose dogs coming in for dental, just routine dental cleanings, dental profies, just because we didn't want to have to sedate or lightly anesthetize the dogs just to get the radiographs. They're already coming in to get the, the teeth clean. They're going to be anesthetized. We'll just go ahead and radiograph the major joints at no cost mm -hmm. to the owners. And these were all owners that were pretty savvy about animal care. They, they were a lot of our uh, people in our veterinary college, veterinarians, students, um, veterinary nurses. And then we had a few outside owners as well. And none of them, except maybe I think two people suspected maybe my dog had arthritis. And, and we, um, we didn't allow them into the study if they had a pre-existing uh, diagnosis of arthritis or any joint surgery. So these were, we, we actually biased the study to get a worse number. And yeah. when we radiographed uh, all those dogs, 60% of them had radiographic arthritis of one or more joint. And so now people can understand what CAM is trying to do. It is so prevalent. And when you consider that the, the main clinical sign of arthritis is pain, and I know that throughout my career, owners have said to me repeatedly, I'll do anything, I just don't want him to be in pain. So if we've got a dog that's got um, vomiting and diarrhea and it's a bit dehydrated, you're suggesting that they're going to stay in the hospital, like, just do anything, I just don't want him to be in pain. Or you have a dog that comes in from a road traffic accident and yet you're trying to give them an estimate and a, a perspective of what's going to happen and they say, I just do anything, I don't want him to be in pain. And then we've got 60% of dogs that are walking into our practices that are, have potentially some degree of pain and it's being attended to. Um, both sides and it's not one particular party there are, dare i say it's a bit of a rude word but there's ignorance on both both sides of the table and i think um talking about it raising awareness of prevalence and then really working together on identification is imperative so any drug companies that are watching this let's just go back about five to ten years there was a really big push on lungworm about five ten years ago and anybody in practice at that point would have known that, you know, we were getting lots and lots of education about lungworm prevalence, et cetera, et cetera. Drug companies get into our practices and start getting people like Daryl Millis to be teaching really good orthopedic examination techniques. Because you can do a blinding orthopedic exam in, what, five to ten minutes? Mm -hmm. I'll you. Yeah. Quicker than that, yeah. Yeah. And just watching you, you you just have your routine you from the front to back you go for it and jobs are done and um people need to be doing it don't they yeah they sure do and and like i say i think that you'll have a better hit rate if you want to use that term of finding a disease process if you look at the musculoskeletal system the, the exception would be maybe the skin you know dogs mm -hmm. have a lot of itchy skin problems dental disease certainly is pretty high but i think the orthopedic uh, system and joint disease. And, and just to back up a point that you said about pain, I, I think a lot of times owners don't perceive arthritis as causing pain because mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have some dogs come back for recheck after say a knee surgery or something. And the dog walks up and down the hallway, we see it being pretty lame. And you know, we ask the owner, do you think your dog is in pain? He says, well, you know, I don't think so. He, he carries the, picks the leg up and carries it sometimes, but he's not in pain. Well, they're not using the leg because it, it hurts, you know, and I think mm. the whole disconnect between what is pain, you know, I think most people, it, at least they uh, think their pain, pet is in pain when they're screaming or when there's mm. abdominal pain, something like that, or they're crying or whimpering or something. But a lot of times orthopedic pain can be more subtle. Um, mm -hmm. They may not be as active. And I've had so many owners tell me that after we find a, an orthopedic problem and we treat it with pain medications and other treatments, they come back and say, we didn't realize how, how much pain our dog was in because now they're acting like a two-year-old again. And we can't mm -hmm. believe the difference. You know, they're, they're, the dog is jumping up and stealing food on from the table. It hasn't done that in two years. Mm -hmm. We just didn't realize. And and I think that we have to be the patient's advocate. We have to be the dog's advocate and say, you know, he can't tell us. He can't tell his owner that no. they're in pain. And, and I think from the owner's perspective, they see these changes so gradually, they may not pick up on it. They may no. just attribute it to old age. Um, yeah. 
Again, Which is a really a really good point for me to just help out a Holly's Army follower that put a post on today. So Holly's Army is this community group that we have where owners get to support each other because it's an extremely emotionally challenging part of dog ownership is when you have an ailment that you're trying to manage. And she said, my dog has always been very difficult to read regarding pain. And when we finally had the vet check and the, you know, the diagnostics done and the degree of arthritis that was there was a shock to everybody involved. So her dog is obviously, you know, coping very well. And she said, therefore, she finds it very hard to work out when to use pain medication. My advice to her is you can use pain medication as a trial. And you can see what the effect of the medication is to the, a gauge of how big a pain problem that was. Um, so you are allowed to do that. We do it a lot with cats because they're really, really subtle with the way that they show that they are uncomfortable. We've got a couple of questions before we go back to another topic that me and you really wanted to talk about. So there's one person that's talking about um, cruciate ligament issues and early neutering. Would you like to give comments on your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that there's been a lot of good information that's come out from lifetime studies um, um, where they've done early neutering, say, before sexual maturity and looked at a variety of different things, the incidence of cancer during the lifetime, the incidence of orthopedic conditions. And I think it's become quite clear that early spay neutering of dogs alters the growth of the length of bones and perhaps, you know, joint configuration and so forth. So I think there probably is um, reasonable evidence or, or reasonable. Clarify uh, early, though, because I think early is different in the U.S. to the U.K. Okay. Yeah. Be before sexual maturity. So okay. um, the bones have ceased growing because right. the big push over here, we have a big pet over population problem in certain parts of the country, not so much in others. But so the, the push for a lot of shelters was early spay neuter, say, at three or four months of age. And yeah. then, you know, the growth plates don't close and develop properly. They continue to grow and the angles of the stifle joint change. And so the, the tibial plateau angle is more steep and the ball that's riding on there it puts more stress on the cruciate. Whereas yeah. if they reach sexual maturity and say go through a heat cycle or two or a male dog, you know, uh, completes their growth process, um, the joints are perhaps a bit more, uh, if you would, normal. That's the way that they should be. I mean, it's it's part of the answer. It's not the complete answer. I think the other part is um, good exercise and conditioning because keeping the muscles around the joint in good tone so that they can correct ab abnormal uh, slips, for example, like if you're walking along a sidewalk and you roll your ankle, and, and you have an immediate proprioceptive feedback to help protect that joint from further uh, damage. And that's something that can be tuned up and, and gotten a bit better with exercise and conditioning. Um, the other thing Which, is- um, that, that covers um, with the Rob Raywood question as well, you know, in that maybe a uh, definite answer is with the elbow dysplasia, hip dysplasia, dogs that are predisposed or have the, are likely is um, talking to the owner about the type of exercise and something that's definitely becoming more available is um, body conditioning and classes that aren't just about puppy obedience and, and behavior um, but also looking at them physically they're, they're very very new yeah you know, but they are coming our way um, another thing to mention just about the cruciate thing I have to say there's been a little bit of vet hate about um, the early neutering. And I would say in my profession's um, defense is that we've done early neutering from the evidence that was collected prior to this new evidence coming out. And many of us were taught at university, um, early neutering was going to risk and um, minimize risks of um, mammary cancer, et cetera, like that. That was with the evidence that we had then, you know, science, as you said, right at the beginning of this, is always progressing and we're always learning more. And quite often there are pros and cons and there's a little seesaw where we put pros and against cons and we try and work out what's the best decision because many things aren't black and white. Right. So just where anybody goes, oh, my vet told me to neuter really early. They don't know anything. Well, they know what they were taught. Yeah, um, yeah. 
there was another question. This is from Emily. She was saying that her, um, what exercise recommendations can you give for a very elderly dog um, with arthritis, intermittent lameness, previously had OCD, decided not to operate, um, still with a zest for life, but physically trying to keep as comfortable as possible for as long as possible. So this is a generic question for many of the cam followers, because many of the cam followers are here because their vet or their friend has said, your dog's got arthritis, this Facebook page, this website will help. So this is going to apply to many people. Give us some generic advice for a dog with arthritic um, changes and mobility issues. Yeah, a great question. Um, and, and I'll answer it from the standpoint that arthritis is an extremely complex uh, condition, um, not only from affecting different joints, but different pathways that lead to the pain and break down a cartilage. So to expect a single treatment to kind of be the answer, um, it's a little bit naive. So we really have to use a multimodal approach to things. Uh, not only from the standpoint of medications and supplements, but also exercise and other uh, modalities. So here's kind of my take on the geriatric patient with arthritis with multiple joints involved. Um, if surgery is not an option for something like a total hip replacement or perhaps uh, some type of an elbow procedure, and, and most of our patients, quite honestly, are not surgical candidates for a variety of reasons. So we manage them conservatively. Number one is weight control. Mm -hmm. uh, over 60% of the pets in um, the US and in the UK I know are overweight. I was just at the uh, obesity clinic in Liverpool in September and they have a great program there. A lot of research coming out of there. And Alex Germain, actually, uh, I'm gonna post another blog as a follow-up to my first blog, looking oh, at yeah. uh, nutrition and so forth. And he had a great article, I think it was published in Vet Record in January of, I think it was 2018, if I remember right, about the crisis of pet overweightness and, and, and so forth. So I know it's an issue. So weight control is so important because it gets the pressure off of those already diseased joints, number one. Number two, fat is an inflammatory tissue. So we have fat kicking out all these inflammatory mediators systemically. Um, you know, that, that's not a good thing. So getting the fat off. Now, the problem is getting the fat off. How are we going to do that? Well, certainly dietary management is part of it. And we have to be very regimented and good about sticking to the plan, uh, making sure there's no underlying medical reasons. So a good medical uh, evaluation first, things like hypothyroidism, for example. Mm -hmm. um, in order to get some of the weight off more efficiently, then adequate exercise is important. Well, pets don't want to exercise because they hurt. So we've got to treat the pain. So mm -hmm. we've got to add some type of pain management non-steroidals, perhaps other things like gabapentin uh, and so forth. Amantadine would be another uh, medication to add in. All of those things to make it easier for the dog to want to exercise. Low impact regular exercise, not bunching it all up at the beginning of the end of the day, but interspersed throughout the day. And kind of my formula or recommendation for combining weight loss and exercise um, it actually is based off something called the Hilton Head Metabolism Diet that uh, I actually tried a few years ago, and it works for people. And what it does is it takes the daily uh, calories and you split it into four meals. So mm -hmm. you, you figure out how much that dog needs to consume per day, split it into four meals. After two of those meals, wait 20 minutes and then do 20 minutes worth of low impact exercise. In the case of a dog, it's most likely going to be leash walking. Maybe the dog can't tolerate 20 minutes uh, to begin with. So we may have to go, well, let's go five minutes, four times a day, mm -hmm. instead of two times, 20 minutes a day. And we're going to try and increase that as a dog regains strength and ability. Exercise yeah. by itself can actually be somewhat of a pain reliever. Um, it, it's a little bit yeah. tough to get it going sometime, but small frequent amounts are the key there. Maybe just five minutes, four times a day, uh, but yeah. try and increase that amount five to 10% each week. And I think as the muscle mass gets stronger, the joints are better supported. They're less able yeah. to kind of wobble. And um, I think that's the key. I like that. I think that's really helpful. Uh, David Dykus is here. He says hello. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you're always together. <laughs> 
Um, what's this uh, about exercise young dogs in open growth plates? Can this lead to early onset of osteoarthritis? What's that? I think you're too late, David. We've done that. <laughs> Catch yeah, up. Just, just to summarize, um, yeah, I think the science is pretty clear that um, normal low impact regular exercise probably does not cause arthritis in normal joints. I think we'll summarize yeah. it that way. Yeah. Or damage to growth plates. Let's just use the, the last minutes to talk about evidence base. So this is something that, again, we talked about before we went live, about how some people responded badly to your blog because they were reiterating what they heard many years before with old science, old evidence, anecdotal stories and art form. Evidence is really important. Why? Why do we keep respond, you know, referring to this? Help owners understand. Yeah, I, I think we don't know everything, certainly. We don't know everything about human medicine. Uh, we, we, we're just scratching the surface on some things, so we don't know everything. Tradition plays a role in it because tradition was developed for a reason. Somebody tried it, it seemed to work, so it caught on. And I would say in the horse racing big business, that's probably got the most tradition behind it. But when you start to add the science to that tradition, one of two things will happen. It'll either confirm that those traditions were in fact correct. You know, the whole thing about grandma used to give chicken soup to a cold. Well, it turns out, you know, chicken soup is pretty good for a cold. So that tradition did um, uh, pan out. And then we sometimes have kind of a butting of heads where, you know, what we thought occurred really doesn't occur. You know, either it's not an issue or maybe it's the opposite thing that's better. And, and I think the whole issue between behind exercise and nutrition of growing dogs, um, there's a lot of evidence base there, but there's also a lot of very strong traditions. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting. I've been watching some of the Facebook posts back and forth on, on this particular topic, this blog. And the people that are more interested in, in show dogs and certain what I would call non-sporting breeds tend to feel one way, whereas the people that are performing, say, doing sled dog racing and other things are saying, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, we do this and this and probably they exercise their dogs more than I would recommend, but they're mm -hmm. having good success. They're training the puppies. So I think they're kind of, you know, spreading the wings a little bit and, and trying new things and finding out this really isn't so bad. You know, mm -hmm. there's in, in trying to apply the science to it. And we're going to keep plugging away and trying to find the science and the reason, but realize that clinical research is extremely difficult because mm -hmm. there are so many individual variations. It's difficult to get owners to comply with a lot of study procedures for, if it's more than one or two visits. For and example. these topics are long studies. Like you, the, the, you were referring to beagles that were being exercised 40k a day, five days a week, yeah, yeah. 10 years, yeah. you know, was, that's me. Yeah, and, and there was actually another study um, that they did this for 527 weeks. They exercised dogs for 75 minutes a day on a treadmill at a fairly low jog or, or walk, carrying backpacks so that they were having the equivalent of 130% of their body weight being placed on their feet. Yeah. And they did that study for 10 years. I mean, yeah. can you imagine how many graduate students <laughs> were uh, exercising dogs? So it's expensive. It's very expensive to do studies. Expensive. It's hard to do good quality research. So we mm -hmm. need some mechanism to uh, have owners participate. It, it's for everybody's benefit in, in the long run uh, yeah. in, in various clinical studies. And, you know, we, we, just need more answers to to supply good information. and i think i don't think the public can really help with this in that when you see fake news being spread around social media stop and go where did that come from what you know where is the evidence behind that and maybe even just say hey you know where's where's this come from can you yeah. tell me which paper or reference it for me so that i know whether there's you know legitimate backing to this because you know, stories on social media, they go, they go nuts quick. Well, and, and one other part to that is, does it make sense? Do these recommendations make sense? Is this how I would raise my child? 
You know, would I keep my child from exercising until they're 18 or 19? Um, Am I going to let my child get overweight? You know, certainly it occurs, but is it the desirable thing? You know, (laughs) I'm going to steal this. This is Kristen Kirby Shaw's phrase. She says it's called evidence based logic. And we are lacking a lot of evidence base because these studies are quite hard to do and laborious and long term. But we can certainly add some evidence evidence-based logic to our decision making um, and yeah. another quick question here before we do our 10 top tips um rachel Bassine, i don't know so you said it um, this is interesting we met an orthopedic surgeon this week who recommended to stop all pain meds apart from prevacox he thought the meds were potentially causing sedation and less movement and that she's overweight <sighs> that's tricky because we can't really judge whether a dog is painful without clinically examining them. So us making, you know, our, our comment now is not very fair. But I think what you were saying is we really need to get the pain under control to encourage the dog to move appropriately to, you know, lose the weight, rebuild the muscle, improve the soft tissue support. Um, <laughs> tricky one, you know, is yeah. the dog actually painful? You need an, a good clinical exam for that. Yeah, for sure. But if you suspect the dog might be painful, there's probably a pretty, pretty good chance that they are. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Right. So we are going to do 10 top tips because we've been going 50 minutes now. And Mr. Dow has got many things to do because he's a very busy, very busy busy person. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to do number 10 because that means that you get to do number one, which is the best one. These 10 top tips are to... Be suitable for everybody that listens. So this isn't people that have got high end insurance only. And it's not just for people that have, you know, got an elderly dog. These are young dogs, old dogs, broad, broad tips. So number 10 for me still and always will be is look at the environment. Um, Cam really was created because I kept seeing people spending a fortune on drugs and supplements and therapies, but their dog was still falling out the back of the car, doing wooden staircases, slipping on the laminate, tripping over the decking. And you just sit there thinking, this is crazy. You're spending 80, 100 pounds a month on medications that your dog might not need if they stop injuring themselves. So please look at the environment. It has a massive role to play and it's part of your pain management toolbox. It's not silly. It's not kind of icing on the cake. It's really important. So number nine for you. Number nine for me, I think, is early identification. So uh, insisting on a, um, a good orthopedic evaluation, even as a puppy, but certainly every year um, as the dog goes back for its annual visits. Very good one. I think number eight for me, leading on from that, because there's a little bit of an echo here now, um, appropriate exercise. So go to your blog um i see quite a lot of dogs that haven't had appropriate exercise and they haven't got good strong core stability and you look at their shape and you think actually if we've done more appropriate exercise at a young age would we be in such a you know, negative situation now and i think you've seen them where they've got these sunken backs and you know limbs going in different directions so so you book up for your puppy class and your young kind of juvenile activities think about something sensible which involves conditioning and appropriate exercise number seven great number seven i think is trying to breed the best to the best um you know doing good selective breeding uh uh, programs, making sure that you check for um, not not just orthopedic things, but all health things. And um, hybrid vigor plays a role as well, too. So, um, yeah, that's really that's important. Yeah. yeah. And try and not get all emotional about your, your protecting your breed. You know, a lot of breeds do have problems. We've got to talk about it. I know that we were having a bit of a, a natter about how you knew of a vet road that would position the dog so that the x-rays would look better. So therefore that dog would have a better hip score. So therefore that breeder could pass their dog off as being better than it was. And you're like, why are we doing this? This is, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number six for me would be add the little things. So I always talk about interactive feeders, Kongs, you know, maze puzzle feeders scatter feeding, um, snuffle mats, licky mats, all of those sorts of things. Um, go back to our previous Facebook lives, distraction, um, 
keeping the brain busy is another way to influence pain and improve quality of life. So look at that as another tool in your toolbox. Number five. Number five, I would say um, use a multimodal approach to arthritis management. In other words, because it is such a complex um, disease process that we can't expect one thing to work. So we have to um, attack the inflammatory cascade from a multitude of, of areas, non-steroidals, fish oils, nutritional supplements, and so forth. That's very good. Four, um, with the multimodal approach, speak to your vets and see what they have to offer. So something we hear a lot about from our owners is, um, my vet didn't have very much time. I always feel rushed. Um, they, my practice doesn't offer me anything. And then when you actually get them to go back, they find that they've got a nurse clinic, they do weight clinics, they do extended consults, they might do um, email you know, consults, phone consults. Go back to your practice, see what they have to offer to you, your long-term management. Number three. Number three, and we didn't really talk about this, but I'll bring it up now. In terms of early diagnosis, use the technology that we have. Most mm -hmm. everybody has a smartphone these days. You can videotape something, play it back in slow motion. So make sure the dog is moving in a straight line because you can't tell anything if they're weaving back and forth. You have to keep them going straight. Even on a treadmill is better. And if you videotape them and then play it back in slow motion, and this goes not just for owners, but also for veterinarians, um, you will be amazed at how many things you've missed just because we can't process things in our brain in real time. But when we slow it down, it's amazing what you'll see. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think for me, number two is don't be scared of getting a diagnosis. Um, I have a lot of owners that you can see they'd rather bury them in the sand. They don't want to know. It's going to be something they don't want to hear. Please go to your vet, get them to do a full orthopedic and neurological or like a rehabilitative examination. Find out what your dog's got and then we can move forward. But burying your head in the sand, pretending it's not happening isn't going to help anyone. Number one, the glorious number one is for yeah, you. Yeah, you know this is coming. Weight control. <laughs> number one management tool for most health things. Um, yeah. It's interesting. There was just a, a, an article. My son is in medical school, and he showed me an article in the New England Journal of Med Medicine, which is one of the top journals for human medicine, talking about intermittent, intermittent fasting and the mm. tremendous health benefits that that has for a variety of things, cancer, weight, uh, insulin control, and so forth. So I'm not suggesting we do that yet with our dogs, but I am suggesting we keep them at a healthy body weight and a good body condition mm. score. And um, owners tend to underestimate how much their dog's body condition score is compared to, say, a nutritionist, a veterinary nutritionist who's you know, doing this from the standpoint of, of medical health and so forth. So don't be ashamed if your dog is a little bit overweight, um, but shame on you if you don't put the dog on a diet to improve its health. Yeah, and the figures are really scary. Nine out of 10 owners of overweight dogs cannot see it. So nine out of 10. That tells you, all you guys that are watching this, go back, get your dog out, <laughs> look at it with fresh eyes and just say, am I lying to myself? Because generally I have people come in and I say, so how do you feel that your dog's weight is? And they're like, it's fine. I'm like, no, seven out of nine. And they're like, really? No. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so please. A lot, of, a lot of great information on the World Small Animal Veterinary Association website. There's a spot on there for dietary management for owners as well as for veterinarians. And there are some body condition scoring pictures there that are very helpful, I think. Yeah, perfect. So all you people that have been amazed at how fantastic this guy is, he has got his own website, which is mylamedog.com. And I'll put it underneath so you can go start following Daryl's work. You're... Um, you're much more interested in trying to get stuff out into the public now, haven't you? You've invested years and years and years in the veterinary profession, but this is a new direction for you, isn't it? It is. And part of it is I'm just frustrated at watching painful lame dogs. If only we could mm -hmm. have gotten to them a lot quicker and intervened. In, and it's, it's not 
anybody's doing anything wrong. It's just awareness. People just don't know. And so that's why I've kind of started to go more public just to try and drive uh, people to have their dogs evaluated, try to drive veterinarians to improve their skills. But the overall mm -hmm. goal is really to improve pet health. Yeah. So there's the mylamedog.com. You've got a book out regarding hip dysplasia for owners. So anybody that wants to get that, they can get it from your website. Right? Yep, it's available on Amazon through Kindle as a download. And I also have paper copies as well. The, the price mm -hmm. is, I think, reasonable. The Kindle version yeah. is five ninety nine. The uh, print version is ten dollars. I purposely tried to keep it low so that everybody can have access. Perfect, perfect. And then you also have your new textbook, Essentials for Physical Rehabilitation. So that's the big orange and blue book, which is the Bible. Yeah. yeah. And that you can get that for your website too. There, as well as through the uh, Veterinary Academy of Higher Learning in Germany, they also carry it in Europe. Perfect. That's actually awesome. the publisher. Yeah. That's the publisher. Okay, cool. Well, guys, um, if you say really lovely things about Daryl, we might just come back. <laughs> we might just come yeah, back. Yeah, be happy um, to come back. Yay! Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I really, it's blown me away that you've been willing to do this because it's so important to me that we get all this information out to owners. So thank you. And if you would ever like to come back, I would just welcome you with open arms. So thank you, thank yeah, you. and I really appreciate what you've been doing i mean obviously your credentials and your your awards and so forth oh, lack <laughs> of. <laughs> no no I, I think we all appreciate what you're doing and i know it's a tough road to go it it's really hard to get things rolling but i think we're both doing it for the same reason so congratulations yes well i will be talking to you again <laughs> thanks cam followers it's been great having you if you've got any questions then just put them underneath and i'll back to them in the next few days put some links to daryl's site and say he's amazing because then he'll come back so thank you guys and we'll see you soon see you later bye thank you <laughs>